There are few things more rewarding than belonging to a loving family. Christian Assembly Berkshires is made up of a variety of people from many different backgrounds and cultures. Every Sunday we meet as a church, but throughout the week there are activities aimed at meeting the needs of kids, teenagers, and adults. Our vision is simple, helping people follow Jesus. Here, nobody's perfect. Beginners are welcome. Forgiveness is offered. Hope is alive. And it's okay to not be okay. We are everyday people looking to discover and experience the abundant life Jesus promised to anyone who would say yes to following him. Enjoy the message. You're probably not going to like, your flesh isn't going to like this message. So, uh, you know, that's tough. Since I've been struggling, you're going to join me. But I, I really believe it's, the Lord's had it for such a time and day as today, and you're the ones that should be here. Who's ever not here, I don't know, but you're here. And so just pause and, and pray with me. Father, we just, we recognize as we get to your word that it is the everlasting word that Jesus said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And that Jesus told us that we do not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds. That you told us if we do, if we're ashamed of your name and your word, you'll be ashamed of us. So as we look to your word today, talk about this fruit, would you prepare our hearts right now? Would you help us to hear what you're saying to us? We just, we, we sang and worshiped the blood of Jesus. I pray that blood of Jesus just wash over us right now. And whatever's on our mind, whatever distractions we all have, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, put, put them to the side. Whatever tomorrow's worries are, you said tomorrow will be here soon enough, but focus on the day. And would you help us right now, Holy Spirit, we need your help. Uh, to hear what you're saying and to respond in the way you need us to respond right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to invite you to be seated. Thank you. Thank you. If, if you're watching this probably at some point on our YouTube channel or Facebook or somebody shared it with you, welcome. God bless you. Uh, I pray that you would like it and share it. I pray that you too would open up your heart to the, to the Word of God. Sometimes you think somebody just shared this with me or I stumbled across it. And, and maybe you did. Maybe you did. Or maybe the Lord kind of put it in front of you to say, can I have a few minutes? Can I have your ear? I have a word. I have a message for you. And so, uh, welcome. Welcome. The fruit, a fruitful culture, that's what we've been talking about. And we've begun with this verse. I want to begin with it again this morning. John 15, 8. Jesus said this. When you produce much fruit, you're my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. And so we've been talking about producing fruit. I think there's so much in this one verse. It doesn't say when you talk about fruit. It doesn't say, you know, when you think. It says when you produce so his call in our life is to produce fruit. It's not just to think about it. It's not, an, uh, it's not just to try. It's produce. We, when we produce fruit, we bring glory. And so this summer, we've been looking at a fruitful culture, bringing great glory to God. We can say we want to bring God glory, and I know we like to sing that. But God, how do we bring you glory? How do you receive glory? glory. And this for sure is, is one of the ways. So we've been talking about a fruitful culture. The word culture, by the way, is simply a word that means it's the way we do things around here. You, you may have a culture in your house, certainly in a church. You can say what it is. You can put words on a sign. But culture is, as you move around, it's the way we do things around here. And so producing fruit, we want to have a fruitful culture, not just a, a July series on fruit, but how do we do this as individuals, as a family, and obviously as a church? And so we saw Jesus in John 15, two real important things he said. I want to look at them again before we move into the fruit for today. John 15, 5 and 15 said, Jesus, 
15, 10. Jesus said, those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. So we saw this is the way there. The way you produce fruit is you remain in Jesus. It's not about working harder, not, not up front anyway. It's about remaining or abiding in Jesus. And then in verse 10, he defined it. He clarified how all of us do that. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. So he told us obedience was the way we remain and abide in him. That's the way we produce much fruit. So remaining is the key idea. And the way we do that is through the application of his teachings in our everyday lives. The way we abide in Jesus is the application of his teachings in our everyday life. So if you need the grace of God, you can pray for the grace of God to be poured out in your life so that you can apply every day in your life his teachings. That's how you abide in him. That's how you produce much fruit. There's no other way. You go find it in here. There's no other way. So we've been talking about that. And he said this in verse 16, John 6, 15, 16. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. So he ended this by saying, this is not a gift. Like, oh, that's not my gift. He said, I chose you to do this. And not only did I choose you, I appointed you, I appointed you to go and produce much fruit. I appointed you to it. So if he appointed you, that means he ordained you and me and us. That means he gives the grace and the power and the way there. If that's what he appointed us to do, that's what he's called us to do. If we come in harmony with us, in essence, nothing can stop us but ourselves. That's it. Amen? So last week, we took a look at the fruit of the Spirit. It's, it's, it's the way we're able to love each other. It's the way the world looks in on us and sees that we love one another. That means we're truly his disciples. And so we looked at the fruit of the Spirit last week. I've been praying about that all week myself. So today, I want to focus on a fruit that's under attack like never before in our culture. It's the fruit of the womb or the fruit of the next generation. And I want, I want you to see what God's perspective is this morning. And I don't just want us to tisk our head at how the world is just terrible at this. We need to take ownership, responsibility anyway, of what the Word of God says. So what I want to do is show you from the Word a proclamation. The Word makes a proclamation about the fruit of the womb, the next generation. And then the Word gives in-depth practice. So God just doesn't say, let's make proclamations and go like this and hold signs. When you leave, let's practice. And then I want to close by sharing with you some passions, a passion the Bible gives, a, a passion of warning and a passion of a cry for the next generation. So let me begin with a proclamation this morning. What's the word say? I'm going to show you a bunch of passages because I don't just want to give you a sentence from a verse, and then talk about it. I want you to see what the Word of God says. Be leery of preachers who give you this much word and then talk you to death for the next 40 minutes. We need the Word of God. We need the Word of God. So that's what I want to give you today. So here's a couple verses that just give the proclamation. I could give you many, many, many verses, but I'm just going to give you a couple. Psalm 127 verse 3 says this. It's the proclamation of how God's perspective on the fruit of the womb or children or the next generation. It says children are a gift from the Lord. They are reward from him. Or your Bible might say the fruit of the womb is, the, is a gift. The fruit of the womb is his reward. The word gift here means uh, heritage or inheritance. So you say, oh, I want God's inheritance. Well, his inheritance he's giving you here, down here, is the next generation. It means it's a thing that's highly valued. Children are a gift from the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. The word reward means worthy benefit of the highest benefit. So if you want God's rewards and benefits down here from him, from his perspective, then what he says is, I've given you my reward. The fruit of the womb is my reward. That's my reward. I've, 
the way I've designed men and women and human beings and how it flows down here is I'm giving the next generation to you. You get to raise them. You have them, whatever you say goes. You raise them. You make choices. You do what you're going to do. That's what he says. And then he'll come back. We'll look at the end of this morning's message. He'll come back and we're going to have to give an account. Because down here, he treasures nothing but souls and his word. So that's all he treasures. He does not treasure what you and I treasure. He doesn't care about your new car or your baseball card collection or your shoes or your football team or your Super Bowls. That, he doesn't care about those things. They're all going to burn. You can, go, you can go look at that. They're all going to be gone. So his reward is not those things. Those aren't his rewards. His rewards are children. He lets this generation raise the next generation. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that scary? Here's what Jesus said. One more verse on proclamation. That's the Old Testament. This is what Jesus said, proclaiming his perspective and his heart in Matthew 19, 13 through 15. One day some parents brought, his, brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. But Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and he blessed them before he left. He said, let the children come to me. Let the children come to me. He told the adults to let the children come to me. In other words, he was saying, You'll be responsible if they don't come to me because you're deciding what they do and where they go. Let the little children come to me. His own disciples assumed without communication that the children would be a bother, that he was doing important things. And so the children would be a bother. So the disciples scolded the parents who brought their kids because they wanted the king of the universe, to lay their hands on their kids and pray for them. And the disciples said, he's too busy, you know, for this. And we all amen this, but I want you to absorb it. I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about this church. We have to think on these things, because like never before is the next generation under attack. The enemy has come hard for them, and we're just mad at the world. But what are we doing? What are we doing? Children are a reward. They're a heritage. They're highly valued. I'm just giving you words we just read from Scripture. They're not a bother. Jesus said, don't stop them. Don't stop them. So the Bible, just in these two verses, we get a proclamation uh, well, what, what's the Bible's perspective real fast? Well, the, the fruit of the womb, children, is a heritage. It's his inheritance. It's a gift. If you want a gift, then you, you follow God's ways to have children, to be involved in the life of children. Just beware, they don't, they're not worth a lot of money. They don't make you any money. As a matter of fact, it costs all your money. All your... All your time, all your energy, there's no more me time. So look out, look out. But that's what he said, if you invest in them, you'll be blessed. So I, I want to move from the proclamation and I want to give you now some passages that talk about practice. Because it's one thing to say, yes, kids are important. And so, if they're important, biblically, what does the Bible say, how, are we, how do we go about dealing, handling this reward, this heritage, this inheritance, the gifts? How do we go about doing this? And so, there's many, many passages about this. So, I want to give you a few this morning. And I know some are going to maybe curl your belly a little bit because we don't understand how much the world has gotten into our mind. You, know, you can understand how much the world has gotten into your mind when you read Scripture and you're offended by it. 
because the world has trained you to be offended by the word of God without even saying it. So here we go. Psalm 78, verse 4, 5, and 7. We will not hide these truths. He's talking about uh, the Ten Commandments, the Word of God, the Old Testament, the instructions and the training that God gave Moses to, to give his people on how to be successful as they live their life and their relationship with God. So he said, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. So it's very specific. He tells us what to tell them. So he doesn't leave it up to our imagination. We will tell them about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children. So if you have your Bible, you can highlight or circle commanded. This is a command. We are commanded to teach our children the teachings of the Bible, the words of the Lord, the ways of the Lord. So each generation should set its hope anew in God, not forgetting his glorious miracles, and obeying his commands. So he's saying, here's the practice. I, I've, I've given you my children. Here they are. I want you to tell them of God's deeds. I want you to tell them of God's power. I want you to tell them of his wonders. I want you to teach them. And I want you to teach to this end. So they'll set their hope in God. Every generation has the opportunity to set their hope. They set their hope where they want to set it. So he's telling the generation, you know, whatever generation's behind you, he's telling you to look to that generation, make sure they know of God's deeds and power and wonders. So you're talking about God all the time to them. So when they come time to set their hope, they set their hope in the God you talk to them about. Because every generation, you don't get to set the hope for the next generation. You don't get to set what your kids hope in. But you get to teach them and train them and influence them. But they will at some point decide whether they do it uh, verbally or not what they put their hope in. Put their hope in God and remember his power. Remember his power. One of the reasons we've lost our, the generation coming up is because they don't think our God has power to do anything. He just sits back like we just sit back and hope whoever we want voted in gets voted in. And maybe they'll make rules and laws that have power. But it's our God that has power. So set their hope, uh, set their hope in God and remember his power and obey his commands. So that's how they're going to live their life. They're going to watch me and you obey his commands so they know how to obey his commands. And we know why God wants them to obey his commands. Because if they obey his commands, that's how they abide in him and that's how they produce much fruit. John 14, he said, if you have my commands and you keep them, you'll experience the love of my Father and I will manifest myself to you. That's another reason why he wants every generation to obey him. Not to keep the generation in line because he wants them to sit down and be quiet and stand up when he says it. Because he wants them to experience his power and his presence and his ways and produce fruit so they can have a, a glorious life of understanding uh, his power, his deeds, as they put their hope in him. And they know his commands. So they can obey his commands. Or at least choose to obey his commands. Because they've watched you. And they've watched me. That's why you come here on Sunday. You get here. Because they're watching you. They're watching us. They're watching us. And they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be. They don't know how to serve God. They're going to watch you. They're going to watch me. How do you serve God? They're going to watch you men. Young men watch old men worship God. You know why they don't lift their hands and cry and sing with all their heart? Because you don't. Because that's not your thing. That's why. That's why. They watch. I know I have five of them. I have three boys. They watch. They see all my flaws, all my mistakes, everything I do and say, 
You don't hide it from them. They watch. But that's a good thing. Because when I make a mistake, they can see if I do it right by the grace of God. Here's what you do when you make a mistake. Here's what you do when you mess up. You go worship God. You ask forgiveness. You repent. Let me give you another verse on practice. The way we practice with the fruit of the womb so they know who God is. They put their hope in God. They know his deeds and his power. And they'll understand his commandments and that what's clear about that is that they would obey the commands that we teach them. You can't just teach them the commands. You have to teach them how to apply them to their life. You can't just teach them the Lord's Prayer. Teach them how to pray. They'll watch you pray. Let me give you a few more passages. I told you this was heavy. Deuteronomy 6, 7 through 9. Again, just talking about the instructions of the Lord. Repeat them again and again to your children. I mean, I could, I could preach that sentence for weeks. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them. Talk about them. When you are at home. I'll read that one again. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home. He's giving you the practice. You don't have to say, what do I do? My, I wasn't brought up in a Christian home, Pastor. My parents didn't do this, so I don't know how to do it. Yes, you do. Maybe it's better for you. You don't have any of the quirks or you don't have any traditions you need to break. You start fresh. You have no excuse if you weren't brought up in a Christian home. The second you meet him, you start following him. You're reading what I'm reading. Well, how do I do this? You just start doing it. You talk about them at home. And when you are on the road, when you are going to bed, and when you are getting up, tie them on your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That's how you train them. There it is. I don't need to, I don't need to bring any original Hebrew word and, and open it up for you and say, what, what does that mean, talk about them? Well, you know what it means? You got to know them. So you got to read. It's our responsibility to talk about the word of the Lord at home. <laughs> at home. Not here. The church is not responsible for your children. You are. They're not going to ask us. They're not going to ask us about your kids. They're going to ask you, where's your kid? Well, if, please, my kid was, well, where is he? Where is she? Didn't you raise them in the things of the Lord? Did you tell them? Did you? Well, our church didn't have a good kids program. Well, that's not what he's going to ask you. You know what he's going to ask you? He's just going to ask you what he said in his word. So he's going to ask you, did you talk about them at home? Talk about what? My word, my ways. Did you talk about them at home, on the road, going to bed, and getting up? There's four times in the day, you should be talking about the things of God at home to your kids. Whenever you're at home, whenever you're on the road, whenever you go to bed, and whenever you get up. Those are the times. So you're talking about the things of God at home. At home. And then when it talks about time on your hands and wear them on your forehead, talk about reminders, reminding you. Write them on the doorposts of your house. You know, in our house when I grew up, there were, there were scripture verses all over the house my wife put. I'd go in the downstairs bathroom and shut the door to be alone. And there'd be this nice little laminated card that said something like, um, uh, he who starts an argument is a fool. <laughs> Just to remind you while you're relieving yourself that you're a fool and you're starting arguments. It, it's all, it was all over our house. We put these things all over our house. You know why? You know why we did it? We didn't figure anything out. We read this. 
we didn't, I don't know what to do. I was not brought up in a born again home, so I didn't know what to do. I just read this. So you know what we did in our house? We talked about it at nauseam. You know how we talked about it? I had to read it and know it first. So I couldn't watch every game, guys. I couldn't have all my hobbies. I was up early in the morning reading the Word because I had to have something to tell my kids about the Word of God at dinner, whenever. I didn't get it all right. They didn't love it. But I'm going to be asked when I get there about this passage. Did you talk about it? Now, when they grow up, it's not on me what choice they make. That's on them. That's on them. But they can't look at me and say, how come you didn't talk about God's word in our home? They can't tell me that. (laughs) That's what you're supposed to do. That's what you and I are supposed to do. So if we want a fruitful culture of children in this building, we've got to be in our homes doing this stuff. Talking about the things of God. Talk about them when you're at home. Talk about them when you're at home. Again and again and again and again and again and again. All the time. Till I guess you don't have them at home anymore. That's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. So we have to know the Word of God. The focal point of our home life is the training of God's word. And then the church comes alongside that. I remember I was a youth pastor in the 90s and parents would come in and they would tell me, you got to do something different. My kid's bored here. They're not interested in God. Can you do some river rafting retreats or something? This is not my job. If your kids are bored with God, that's on you. That's not on me. If my kids are bored with God, that's not on you. That's on me. Why are your kids bored with God? Are you talking about it at home? No. We paid good money to send them to church camp. The results are out there. Listen, there's research done. I looked at it when I was a youth pastor and associate pastor. They took kids that were active in youth group from age 16 to 18 active in youth group. And then they went, they found the kids 10 years later, 26 to 28. Which ones 10 years later were still, had an active follow of Jesus' life and were active in a church? Over 90% of the kids that were still active, it had nothing to do with the youth group they were in. They were all kids that came from homes where mom and dad went to church and read the Bible. Over 90% It had nothing to do with church youth group. Nothing. Sorry, we have church youth group here. We want to have, we want to certainly come alongside and have stuff for kids to be here. Absolutely. But if you want your kid to follow God, that comes from your home. The fruit of the womb, that comes from your home. So you can open your Bible. You can go get King James, ESV, The Message Bible, go get whatever translation you want. It's going to say the same thing. You better change what you're doing at home. That's how you get your kids to follow God. So you're not in my office weeping when your kid's 20-something and they've walked away from God. They don't have to like you. You are not your kid's best friend. So you're going to have to get over that. They will thank you. When life comes their way and somebody at home loved them enough to say, you can't do that. You can't go sleep around. What are you doing? You're living in sin. You live in sin, you're going to hell. Let's get to the word of God. How can I help you? I don't mean just tell them. I mean help them. I mean shut the game off. Put your tools away, dad, and go help them. Don't send them to their mother. They came to you. You're the man. Pray with them. Cry with them. Talk to them. You do know what to do. You have been equipped. I just read John 15. He's appointed you to do this. Talk to them. Pray with them. 
open your mouth and spend time with them and talk to them about the things of God, the Word of God. If you were a mess up growing up, then you use that to say, you humble yourself and say, let me tell you how fortunate I am to be here. These are all the mistakes I made. You don't have to make them. And then when they make them, don't say, I told you so. You hug them and you tell them you love them and you walk through it with them. So the next time they come to you before and say, I want to talk to you about something. That's what they need. They don't need me. They don't need a song and dance kid program. Jesus. That works till they're about four. Then life hits. And they need more than a kick and a song and a dance. They need you. They need you and they at 11 at night and you're exhausted. Can I talk to you? You know what you do? You get up with your exhaustion and your little headache and you talk to them. What else are you here for? For what? What are you going to bring to heaven? What are you here for? To bring them with you, right? That's all you're bringing with you. Them. Just them. Nothing else. That's all that's getting in. The word of God and the souls of men and women. And you go after them with reckless abandon. You go hard after them. That's all the enemy's coming for. He'll give you the blessings and the money and the car and the health. He'll give you all of that. Just as long as you leave your kids to him. Let him tell them how to live and what to do and where to go. That's all he wants. He'll make that bargain with you every single time. Now the church come alongside. We want to do that with you. But we can't take your place. When I was a youth pastor, I couldn't do it. There was, there was no teenager I saved. None. The kids that ended up okay is when we could get some uh, changes in the home. That was it. Otherwise, you know, because that's God's design. He created men, male and female, and they came together, and they had children, and they raised the children. That's his design. That's how he did it. And I know there's single moms and single dads. My dad left when I was two. God will give you the grace and the strength, and it may be unique for you, but you still go after them. You still go after them. And I know I was hard on dad. You're coming, mom, in about a minute. So I want to read you a few verses that we don't read anymore. We shy away from this whole road of thinking because the society has captured this. They've, they've kidnapped it from us. The roles of men and women and husband and wives. And we don't say these things anymore because we're so desperately offended that God has roles for men and roles for women. The value is the same. We have the same value. But the world has told us if our value is the same, then we're the same. But that's a lie. Our value is the same, but we are different. Men and women are different. I hope you still get that. So let me give you a few verses on just some roles so you can understand your role. Ephesians 6.4 says this. Fathers... Do not provoke your children to anger. So the first thing God wants to say to dad is he wants to talk to us men about our anger. Because that's the thing that ruins us. Because you're so mad at work all day or whatever you're doing and you come home in your anger. And, you know, we could talk all the anger verses. So he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. By the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. That's what you're supposed to do, Dad. That's what it says. It's real clear. Discipline and instruction of the Lord. You have to know the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. You can't say, I don't know it. Then go learn it. 
put your hobbies away and go learn the things of the Lord so you can bring your children up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Not your anger, not provoking them to anger. Don't provoke your kids to anger. So you're going to learn, Dad, how to change your ways by the power of God when your kids mess up. Right, Dad? Because that's when we get angry. I told you to take the garbage out, and inevitably, they're not going to take the garbage out. I told you, and you didn't do it. So what we do is we get angry, and we yell. That's called sinning in your anger. You're not going to win them over. You have to change, sir. Not them. You. They don't have to change. They're in training. You're training them. You're teaching them. When you grow up, this is what you do when people don't do what you want them to do. You yell at them. That's what you're training them. So, it's addressed. Don't provoke your children. Bring them up. It is not mom's job to bring them up. You bring them up. You lead devotions. You lead prayer. You open the Bible. You set the meeting. You say, this is what we're talking about at dinner. Well, we don't have dinner anymore. We do now. We do now. We're getting together at some point because at least food I can get you around the table. And we're going to talk about the things of God. Something. We're going to get out a verse and we're going to talk about it. You do that, Dad. You want to be the man, the leader. You do it. You do it. Start fighting for the right things, men. And if you need to leave this service and go call your grown-up children and repent, then do it. Would you forgive me? God's convicted me. I didn't do it right. I know you can't go back, but you can acknowledge it now. Dad is the key. Sorry. I take that sorry back. Dad is the key. Why do you think our culture wants dad out of the home? Because the Bible said dad is the key. You can provoke him to anger or bring him up in the discipline of the instructions of the Lord. You need to know the instructions of the Lord. And they need to watch you doing it in your life. They need to watch you men reading the Bible. Not telling them to obey you. They need to catch you reading and praying and obeying. Right? They catch it. That's how you learn. Most of our kids are visual. You want them to take out the trash? You take out the trash with them. Then they'll take it out. Okay, ladies. <clears throat> Let me give you one verse. Titus 2.4. <clears throat> These older women must train younger women to love their husbands and their children. So the job of older women is to teach younger women how to love their husbands so their children can see this is how you love an unlovable man. <laughs> and love their children. So you spend your whole life, mom, figuring out how do I love my children, not how do I get my children to do what I want them to do. That's not the question. The question is how do I share the love of Jesus? How do the children see the love of God in and through me? Well, it gives you help. Find some older ladies that have been there, done that. Would you pray with me? Would you help me? And they may not know everything. You don't have to be at every women's meeting, all these women's events. Just go home and keep your home and love your husband and love your children. Let them see the love of God flowing through you, mom, with forgiveness and passion and tears and insight and training and wisdom and discernment. And when dad comes home and he's a mess and he's a mess up and they turn to you, you show them, mom. The love of God, even when dad gets angry and messes up, you show them. You don't tell them your dad's a turkey. Just because he is, you don't have to share the obvious truth all the time. Love them. Love them. Love them. When they're good, when they're bad, 
Love them, mom. You don't need hobbies. You need to get out and find your gifts and all your things you need to do. Love your kids. Love them. I know I'm offending you. It's okay. Because the enemy is coming after your sons, ladies. They're coming after your daughter, mom. And he's drooling for them. He just wants you to be so busy, you don't have time for them. It's just way too busy. Love them. So you see the combination. There's, there's, there's discipline and instruction and love. And that doesn't mean dad doesn't love. And that doesn't mean mom doesn't give instruction. That both be, these big circles cross like this. You know, it all, as you lay it out, it's all there. I'm not, but I'm not telling you moms don't instruct and discipline and dads don't love. That's not what I'm saying to you at all. But what I'm showing you is scripture verses. If you have enough courage to trust in the Lord that this is what he does. This is how this works. I cannot tell you the people that have come up to my wife and I and said, what have you done with your kids? What books have you read? And I went, that's the problem. That's why you're never going to get your kids how you want them. Because you think we read a book? We didn't read a book. My wife quit teaching, went home, homeschooled, and we've been doing it for 25 years. And I pastor at the church and I go home. We invested our whole lives in them. We didn't read a book. We didn't go to the parenting seminar weekend and then everything was yummy, yummy. You have to make a decision that this is your life. That's what we did. We don't have enough money. We didn't have enough money either. We just didn't let money be the decision whether we were going to do what we needed to do with our kids for God. You do what you need to do with your kids. But you get one shot. One. That's it. One. So if you're going to hesitate, don't hesitate about this. You can make a million mistakes. It doesn't matter. This is not about perfection. This is about a choice and traveling down that road. Because your kids watch that. Your kids don't care how many mistakes you make. They care if you love them. They care if you teach them, instruct them. I had friends growing up when I was in junior high and high school. I envied them because they had no rules. They could stay out whenever they wanted to come in whenever they wanted to. I didn't have that. So I liked their parents way better than my parents. My parents were downer and bummers. Their parents were awesome. Their parents understood. And that's not how it went. They wished their parents had rules for them. They would tell me, my parents don't care. They don't care about me because... I can stay out however late I want to stay out. I can do whatever I want to do. They would say that at the time. At the time. Your kids don't need you to be their friends. They got enough friends. And guess who picked you to be their parent? Guess who picked you to be your kid's parent? Guess who made that decision? God did. Does he make mistakes? Zero. I can't do it. I can't, mom. I can't, dad. I can't. Lies, lies, lies. God makes no mistakes. Zero. If you're mom and dad, he picked you. You may, he may, it may be training. It may be training. It may be training. You just, oh, let me give you one more verse. Proverbs 22, 6 for the training, right? Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. This is the favorite one we use. But we forget to focus on the word train them up. You can't tell them which way to go. You're their trainer. Have you ever had a trainer in sports? Have you ever gone to the gym and get a trainer? The trainer comes with you, meets you at the door, walks you around to the equipment, shows you what to do on the equipment. They write down what you're doing because they're training you. Most parents, in my experience, that mess this up, they just tell their kids stuff. We're just telling them stuff. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. You think your kid wants to read their Bible? You don't want to read it. They're not going to read it. Read it with them. You read it with them. 
You got to train them. Train them. Someone is training your child. I hope it's you. Listen, I was a public school teacher for 11 years in the 90s. I can't tell you behind closed doors what they were talking about then. What they're doing now is unconscionable. So you just can't send them off to Rome and think they're going to be Christians. If you send them off to Rome to get training, they're going to come back as what? Romans, right? Why are we shocked when we send them to a place that says, bring everything in here except God? And we send them there to be trained. We tell them, be an evangelist. We didn't, you're not sending your kids to school to be an evangelist. You're sitting them under masters to teach them. So you better have a plan at home. Somebody is training your kids. Somebody is. Somebody is. We have, I don't have one up here with me, out where we have the LGRs, the life-growing relationships, people getting together, teams of three or four, to share life and talk and pray. And we have a booklet out there. It's called LGRs for Families. I beg you to take one. Mom or dad or grandma or grandma. In the day and age we live today, there's a lot of people in charge of kids. Whoever you are, you'll get the anointing. I'm not, don't sit there and say, well, because I didn't have the perfect mom and dad and two kids in the family. If your mom or your dad or your adopted or your grandma, or your aunt, your uncle, you got it, then, you, then you're in charge. You're the parent. You get the anointing. There's a, there's, we have one out there uh, for families. It's just simple, uh, a rough outline you can take. There's just a scripture verse and some questions to talk about and pray about. Take it. Do it at home. You can do it for an hour. You can do it for 15 minutes. Begin something. Please begin to talk at home with your kids, however old they are, about the things of God. And, and however they respond, your job is not to get them to respond right. If they laugh at you and they mock at you and they roll their eyes and they don't want to hear it, don't, don't buy into that. Don't take that hook. Don't yell and scream. Just keep going. The mercy and the love of God, you'll win them over. They are listening. I don't care if they do this. They are listening. The word of God does not come back void. I know how hard it is. I have five of them. I know how hard it is. I know how much time it takes. I know all the mistakes. I'm asking you today, to grow courage and start doing it with your kids. And you don't have to go buy a curriculum. You don't have to go on YouTube and Google and find the, the kids at home kit. Just get a Bible and open it up and read some red and talk and laugh and cry and share and listen. And don't correct them everything they say. You don't have to defend Jesus. Just be, just start it. It won't come back void. And if you're dad and you're in here, I dare you to do it. I dare you to be a man of God. And open the Bible at home. My kids have come down the house, the stairs in my house for the past however many years I've been there. Before I was a pastor. And they know right where I'm going to be or one or two spots. I'm going to be sitting there with my Bible open every single day. That's how they know they have to read the Bible. When they started school, I told them, you will learn to read for one reason only. I don't care if you go to college. That's going to be all on you. You will learn to read English because you will read the Bible. You will. When you get to be an adult... That's all on you. But you will learn to read because you're going to read the Bible. I don't care if you go to college. I don't care what grades you get in school. I don't really care about any of those things. When we had serious talks, that's what I told them. But you will learn to read because you will read God's word. You will find out about the God that made you and what he said about you. And then you can decide what you want to do when you get older. But you will read and you will learn to read and you will read this book. And I will read it with you. And we will talk about it. And if you have questions you can't answer, I'll go find the answer. And if I can't find the answer, I'll tell you, I don't know. You got me. Ask God. I can't get the answer. But you will do that. We do communion at home. We read communion in the Bible. I would get little cups and grape juice and crackers and do them at home. No one t I didn't go to the parent seminar. 
I said, oh, it said communion. Let's do communion. We read it, did communion. Anybody have any sin or you need to ask forgiveness here? Those times were unbelievable. And then I'd make them read the verses. I didn't get that. And don't think I got that at pastor training classes. There was no pastor class I took that taught me that. I just read it in the Bible. So we did it at home. You can do that at home. You have the freedom in your home to do whatever you want to do. So that's great. They watch Veggie Tales and you watch the Christian TV, but that has nothing to do with training them in the ways of the God. That's just clean entertainment. I'm grateful for clean entertainment, but it does not train your children. You train your children. I train my children. That's how it works. So let me give you two passions. Let me give you two passions. We have got to train our children. The enemy is coming for the next generation like never before. I've never seen anything like this in all my life. Nothing like I'm seeing now. He's coming fast and furious. And we're just mad at the world. You have the power. The world doesn't. You do. You know you do from John 15, 16. Jesus said, I have ordained you. I've ordained you to bear fruit. And I've given you the fruit of the next generation. Go get them. Go get them. They're yours. Don't just fight the world. I'm not telling you there aren't times we do our thing. But my goodness... What are we doing? What are we doing on a Sunday morning when a kid's next to you and he drops a cheese it and his juice spells in, your, it spells in your lap and you get up and leave all offended? What are you doing? Just sit down and wipe your pants and eat the rest of the cheese it and rub the kid on the head. He's in church. So it's a little bit, eh, 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 eh. the babies do all that. So what? God's telling you, focus in now. Focus in. You want to just get out of their car and go on the other side till they're 18. You've lost them. We've lost them then. And over there, they just do kid stuff, kiddie stuff. Too many kids, when they get 10 and 11 and 12, parents tell me, Pastor, my kid can't come in the sanctuary yet. Why? What are you doing at home? Why can't they come in here? What are you doing? You don't prepare them for king's kids. That's a temporary place while they're little. You're preparing them in here to contribute in worship at the earliest age possible. Not 18. We need them in here. They're part of the body. They're not a bother. What are we doing? But that's what we do. Well, I need the church with the best kids ministry. So I don't ever have to be with my kid then you need a whole Holy Ghost attitude adjustment. And I don't say, I know it's hard. My wife spent a decade in the foyer with babies walking around crying, saying to me, we'd go home. Why do I even go? What am I there for? I don't do nothing. I don't mean anything. I'm just walking around the foyer with babies. So I'm not saying this like I don't know it's hard. But I didn't have an answer for her. I don't know what to tell her. You want me to go out there? You're the stupid pastor. you got to be in there. I'm out here. I'm the wife. You don't know what it is to be a wife or a mother. Just go in there and do your sermon stuff. But it was hard for her. She wanted to be in here, mom. She wanted to be worshiping and talking and in all these ministries and doing stuff. Because that's what we said we value now. In here, mom has to have high value. You see, mom, come in with kids, and you're like, oh, boy. I, I would come over if I couldn't give you a, doesn't the Bible say a holy kiss? I'd give you a holy slap. <laughs> what are you doing? That woman is teaching those ch children how to love God. What are you doing? They need to come in here and come alongside them and help them. They, they don't not walk out and say, well, I can't go there until I don't have kids. That's a real fruitful culture. Now, I'm not saying if the kid's kicking and screaming and whipping cupcakes, we don't say, ma'am, we got to take little David outside and, and, you know, he can't be whipping cupcakes at the pastor. And, you know, we, and, and you, if you watch, you see moms and dads, they wrestle with that. When do I take him? I want to just, just let them take a minute. It's a holy moment. 
You do not have any idea what's happening in those moments. That mom and that dad are making decisions on the spot. Am I really welcome here? Is this really going to be a place where I can bring my kids? They, they have to be able to come here. They have to be able to come here. And that doesn't mean let your kids run wild. Teach your kids at home how to sit down and be quiet for a little while. Please. Well, my kid can't sit down ever. They just can't sit down. Train them. Shut the stupid thing off. And say, we're going to play a game at home. It's sit down for two minutes game. Then it's three minutes game. My wife used to bring a blanket in like this when they were babies and put them on. They'd crawl off the blanket. She'd give a little, ah, they'd learn, stay on the blanket, stay on the blanket for this time. It was hard, ladies. She spent her whole life training them. She's still training them. And they're grown-ups. And then they could sit down for a little while. They didn't have to sit down for two or three hours. Just You can do that. You can train them. You can do that. It's going to take effort and time. If you don't ever train them, and they don't know how to sit down in church, that's on you. You just expected them to learn. What did your parents do? They just let you do anything, right? Your parents let you do that. I know the stories we've talked. Your parents, uh uh-uh. So you don't have to be your parents. But, you know, they need to have some training to be in here. They just can't come in here and just run circles around the place. That's not what I'm saying. If you think that's what I'm saying, you're going to run into problems. That's not what I'm saying. But I am telling you, moms and dads and adults and us older folks, we have to be flexible and understand. We want the kids to be able to be here. So sometimes a kid can't sit like you can because I'm a long preacher. As long as you are doing your thing, they may need a cheese it or they may need a thing. And that, but there's no food and drink in the sanctuary. If you come up to me and say, Pastor, I'm going to side on the kid. If you have apple juice and Cheez-Its, then I'm going to have an issue. You need to be able to make it. But if mom is sneaking uh, apple juice and Cheez-Its, or or you healthy moms, your carrot things or something, it's okay. No one's going to frisk you at the door. We'd rather have you here. And if you need to walk back, back and forth, walk back and forth. But they need to be here. At some time and place, they need to see what it looks like when people are worshiping God. So they need to be here. And they need to be ready at 10 or 11 or 12 at least to be in here. To be able to be in here. And that's not on them. That's on us. That's on us. Otherwise, we're just walking him to the devil. Because he is fast and furious. He must know that the time is short. And so he's coming after your kids. And my kids, and your grandkids, and your nieces, and your nephews. So when we have kids programs here, would you, if you could, could you help out some? Not that it's the end all be all here, and not that it's the funnest thing on earth to do. I mean, if you see some stuff and you got some time, could you help out once in a while? If all of us helped out a little bit, we could, we could get the job done. I'm too busy, I know. I'm praying for you to get revival. Two passions. The first passion I want to close with is a warning. Lori, why don't you come up with the team and just kind of get ready. Okay, so this is a real hard, passionate warning from Jesus. And so I want to give this to you today because this is, this is just, when I read this verse, I almost, my stomach curls. This is what Jesus said, Mark 9, 42. This is the passion the Bible has for the next generation, for our children. Jesus said, but if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you. This is Jesus speaking. It would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. What? What did the king of kings just say? What did your savior just say? What did the lover of your soul just say? If you cause, if you're part of the cause, and the phrase little ones here has two references, children and new Christians. Okay, so there's two applications. If you cause little ones 
to fall into sin, it would be better to go out on a boat in the sea. And I did some research on millstone. These things are a lot of pounds. I want you to hear what he's saying. I want you to hear the passion for people that are involved with causing children to sin. I, I don't know what to tell you, but you're in grave danger. As a nation, we're in grave danger. We're doing this as a nation. We're lying to them. We're even killing them. We're bringing them into sin. As I was reading this, I was praying, God, forgive, forgive this whole nation, not them. I said, us. Look at the passion. It would be better. It would be better if we're just walking kids into sin. Maybe no one else is watching. Jesus is watching. Jesus is watching. And woe is us. Woe is us if we're walking them into sin. Right? Because they're so vulnerable. They believe anything. Right? Jesus said, I just want you to know if you're going to start walking down this path, it would be better for you if a millstone was hung around your neck and you jumped into the sea. I, I don't even have a response to that. And let me close with one more passion. It's a cry. In the Old Testament, uh, Nehemiah was called, was called on by God to go back. God had let Israel and Jerusalem, they all got taken into Babylon. They were there for 70 or 80 years, and it was time for them to come back. And God started moving because he prophesied that they would come back and rebuild Jerusalem in, in Israel. And so they were starting to do that. And one of the most famous people that did that was Nehemiah. Nehemiah built the wall. God, the Spirit of God put it on Nehemiah, and he talked to the king. And so Nehemiah went from Babylon back uh, to Israel. And, you know, back then... For sure, if you didn't have a wall, it didn't matter how big the city was, the wall represented protection. And so Nehemiah's job was to build a wall. And so as Nehemiah got there and he had supplies and different things and they began to build the wall. But sure enough, you know, the enemy was coming against them. The enemy was using uh, people around uh, Jerusalem and Israel, Sanballat. It's just different. You can read the story of Nehemiah. They were coming up against them and they were... They, they sent letters back to the king. They were vehemently, they did not want the walls to be built up so the people could be protected. And so at one point, as, as Nehemiah has the Jews and they're building the wall up, and while they're building the wall, they've been getting threats. So they're looking over their shoulder. Because <laughs> while they're building the wall, the enemy said that's when they'll be most vulnerable, right? They'll hammer however they're building the wall the enemy is going to come and threaten he's going to kill them all because they're building the wall and in the middle of doing that there's this passage there's this verse that Nehemiah spoke and I think it's so perfect for today it's Nehemiah 4.14 it says then as I it's Nehemiah talking then as I looked over the situation or he looked over the situation I called together the nobles, and the rest of the people. And I said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. That's what he told them to do. Don't be afraid of the enemy. So I want to say that to you. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. Don't be afraid of the enemy. He's just loud and loud. There's nothing he can do to you. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. You're ordained for this. You've been given the grace and the power and the strength to do this. God has a, ordained you to influence and raise and train and teach and instruct and love the next generation. So they put their hope in the Lord. They won't remember his power and they'll obey his commands. He's saying this, remember the Lord. 
remember the Lord, remember the Lord, and then fight. He said, fight for your family. Fight for them. And if you go on and read the rest, he said, put a sword in one hand and a hammer in the other. And they'd build the wall like this, looking over for the enemy. And that's just the time we live. You just can't pray, oh God, uh, protect my children in Jesus' name, amen. You're going to have to fight for them. He said, that's what he told them in Nehemiah. Fight for them. Build a wall and fight. Fight in prayer. If you've got to go to work at 5 a.m., get up at 4 a.m. and pray. Fast. Fight with prayer and fasting. Be in the Word of God. Get yourself to church. When we start worship, stand up and show the kids how to worship. And come to the altar and read their Bible. Fight by, fight sin, the sin in your life. Fight it. Let them watch a man and a woman going after God. Wrestling with this world and winning. Because you have the power. You have the victory. But we've stopped fighting. We're afraid of the world. Stop being afraid. They're your children. Your DNA is running through their veins. Go get them. And whatever's in the way, get it out of the way. You have been ordained for this. Fight for them. Fight for them. That means fight for your marriage. Fight for your marriage, men. Fight for your marriage, women. I know your spouse stinks. Fight for your marriage. Because your kids are watching. They want to know, does God have any power? Because they hear all the fights at home. And if you're a single dad, then go for it. If you're a single mom, go for it. Let them watch how God moves in your life. Let them know even if you make mistakes and things don't work out right, you can still serve and follow God and watch God work and move and let them see the scars in your life and talk to them about it. Tell them about it. Don't hide it from them. And pray with them. And cry with them. And laugh with them. And read the Bible with them. And memorize it with them. And talk to them. And listen to them. And listen to them. And listen to them. And shut your mouth. And listen to them. Find out what they're thinking. What they're going through. What they're feeling. And stand outside their door. When they're sleeping at night. Put your hand on the door. And cry out for them. What else are you here for? For a good time? Why are you following God anyway? So you don't have any pain or struggles. He's already taken care of that. You're headed to a place that there's not even any words to talk about. While you're here, you are at war. So don't tell me, it's so hard. It's so hard for me. I'm a victim. It's so hard for me. Well, you know what? You're probably right. All the more power and glory is going to come when you make the right choices. There's no temptation that's come on you that's not common to the rest of the world. And I know some of your stories. They're way, I've not gone through half of what many of you have gone through. But there's no excuse for the fruit of the next generation. They need to see us and God. So they say, yeah, that's what I want. So you need to say, hey son, hey daughter, watch me as I follow him. Watch me. You follow me as I follow him. We don't have any more time, folks. Nobody's coming. No one's saving your kids. It's on you. You have to hear the battle cry. We will be responsible for how we handle the fruit of the next generation. Every generation will be responsible with how they handled the generation coming up. Did they love them? Did they share with them? Did they, did they at least influence them and lead them? Every generation makes their own decisions. 
Your children will make their own decisions. And we have heartbreaking stories and we're praying for many. That's the truth too. Everybody makes their own decision. But as far as they watching you goes, there's no doubt. Who you are and what you stand for and what you give your life for. We have got to get this. We have got to get this. We have got to get this. I know I'm long. I don't know where my notes are. I don't even know when I came off them. I have a passion for the next generation. And if you don't, you're probably not in the right church. If you just want little ditties and little events and little concerts, you'll probably have to find another church. It's a big fruit. The fruit of the womb is his reward. It's the hardest fruit. Because the next generation, they just don't have a clue. Their music's terrible. Their clothes is terrible. Their hairstyle's terrible. Their shows are terrible. And it's just, they just don't know what we know, right? And yet love them. You see kids in this church, would you greet them, shake their hand and look them in the eye? Would you pray for them? Especially men. Ladies too, but especially men. Don't just come in here, men, and sit in the back row or sit in the corner and wait till the singing's done. And while I bow my head to pray, walk out and go home. Be a man. Be here. We need you. The next generation needs you. So sit down. You're not going to miss the game or wherever you're going. And get involved at least with some kids. Pray for them. Talk to them. They look up to you. They watch you. I know I have five of them. Be a man. Be here. When I pray, don't go sit in the car and wait for your wife and kids to come out. At least be present while everybody's here. 